everyone. Welcome back to our second of our four-part series in talking about surviving and thriving during the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, I'm here. I'm Sue Lepore from ASCII Library, from our Resource Lending Library, and I'm here with our wonderful guest, Dr. Jean Clinton. As you know, Dr. Jean Clinton is a clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences at McMaster University. She's best known for being an advocate of children's mental health well-being and in self-regulation. So I welcome Dr. Jean. Welcome back. Hi, how are you, Sue? This is great. I'm so glad we're doing this. Excellent. Thank you, Jean. Today, we're going to dig deeper into the emotions behind this pandemic. And it's something that we've never experienced before. And so I'm wondering if we could begin our conversation today about how do we talk to children about the emotion behind COVID-19? Right. Well, it's such an important question to ask. And you know, what comes to mind absolutely immediately is that we manage our own emotions first, that we think about it. It's like, you know, in the, in the airplane where they say, put on your own mask first. So we have to put on our own mask first, figure out our own emotion. And so then once we're, once we're, once we're super people, and are able to do that, uh, then we can reach out to the kids. And the number one thing I say is listen, listen. As we want to find out how our kids are feeling, many of us jump immediately into uh, labeling or telling them what they should be feeling or imagining what they're feeling. And what we need to do is stop and listen hear what their worries are, if they have any, how do they understand it? You know, why can't I see Uncle Jojo? Um, and and the, you, you think, oh, I have to tell them all about the big COVID-19. And all they want to know is, well, because he's got his sunglasses on, I can't see him. So we really need to be where the kids are at. And why, why is that? Well, what we know is that when we meet children, where they're emotionally at, then we can help regulate them. We become co-regulators of them. We sit with them, we help them label the emotion. And what we know is when you can regulate, then you're better able to relate. And as you're able to relate, then you're better able to reason. So helping kids find out where they're at, giving them language for their emotion that's relating with them. And then they can say, you know, I had a scary dream last night. I didn't like it, but tonight I'm going to tell that scary brown cow to go away. So if we listen, then we hear. If we hear, then we connect. So it makes such a big difference for emotions. What's our long-term goal? I am loving the work of Mark Brackett and the, um, uh, the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. And so what he says is, um, uh, he says you have to follow the ruler method. And I want you to tie it in with the tools for life that we talked about before, Sue. But he talks about the ruler, R for recognize, U is for understand your emotion, L is for label your emotion, E is for express your emotion, and then finally you get to regulate that emotion. So we can help co-regulate kids by doing all of those things uh, with them and for them. So does, does that tie into, you know, you're our, you're our, our, our pro on uh, what the community has been focusing on? Thanks, Jean. Yes, many of our early childhood centers are working on exactly those kinds of concepts about labeling emotions and recognizing emotions within themselves and within others. And when they do that, they're better able to find a way for their calm and to get along with others and other pro-social type behavior, behaviors and getting along with others in knowing how to solve their conflicts. And um, these are all wonderful, useful tools for families to also have those kinds of conversations, acknowledging emotions and labeling their emotions and just validating how they're feeling is oftentimes a wonderful first step in getting out their feelings on a deeper level about how they're feeling about what's happening in our world today. 
You know, Sue, as you're talking about that, I am so struck by my training in child psychiatry, the similarity that we are talking about giving kids the skills that as a child psychiatrist, I help families recognize that they need to develop and, and share with their own children. It's uh, uh, this whole emotional, um, social and emotional learning is such an, a, a key concept. And maybe now is a time when we can emphasize it even more. Absolutely. The centers are doing a remarkable job of offering kids all kinds of wonderful opportunities to express themselves. I've seen wonderful art activities, musical activities, bringing stories to life. Uh, I've even seen Play-Doh where kids, yellow tinged Play-Doh where they've made emojis with little loose parts. And then they talk about it and everyone can relate that there are times where we all feel that way. And they're using wonderful stories with puppets and talking and exploring about how they're feeling and what they can do when they're feeling a certain way and giving them those tools in their own personal toolbox. Sometimes the tools are different for different kids. It depends on what really resonates well with them. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fantastic. And you know, if we were on with um, Mark Brackett and his book, Permission to Feel, he would just be singing so loud and long because this is, he is a, on a mission that, uh, that we, that kids are learning this. So it's, uh, it's so great to hear. And so what great ideas for uh, families to try at home as well. I love it. Thank you, Jean. I'm wondering if maybe you could spend a few moments in talking about stress behavior versus misbehavior. Oh boy, it's so, so important. So, you know, I want to, I want to kind of think about it in two categories in, or in two kind of ways. One is um, in the area of what we know that our stress, when we're experiencing stress as adults, has a leaking effect that has an effect that kindles it lights the flame of stress in other people uh including our kids so um uh stress behavior affects children's behavior but you know we need to give ourselves a bit of a break because what we can learn from our own stress behavior is that if we can connect with other people then that stress, which they may interpret as misbehavior, you know, you're yelling at your kids or you're yelling at your, uh, or your partner, is not really a bad behavior on your part. It really is coming from stress. And when you can connect to others, it helps neutralize and it buffers that stress. So that's one thing I think we need to keep in mind, that sometimes our behavior which is misbehavior as adults, is really coming from our stressors. The second is the parallel process, as they talk about, is with kids. So we see behavior, every behavior has a reason and it has a meaning. And behavior is communication, straight and simple. And if we can imagine that the behavior that we're seeing is the tip of an iceberg, then we can dig deep and see, well, what is it that's underneath that behavior? What's the story that I can understand where the behavior is coming from? I have a very firm belief. I love the work of uh, co collaborative problem solving, Ross Green and Stuart Ablon, that they say all kids will do well if they can. They're not doing things, believe it or not, to drive you crazy or send you over the edge. They will do well if they can. And so what you may be seeing is, uh, uh, is stress behavior. So that means become a stress detective. So you see that at a particular time of the day, the kids are discombobulating. Ask, is it something physical? Are they hungry? Are they tired? Uh, is the light too bright? Is there too much noise going on? Emotionally, am I overcharging them? Am I expecting too much? Am I creating too much um, um, uh, brouhaha around? There's wonderful work done by um, Stuart Shanker uh, through Self-Reg that asks you really to reframe the behavior. Think of it as stress 
rather than misbehavior. And ask yourself, is there an emotional stressor? Is there a cognitive stressor? Is there a stressor in terms of relating and getting along with others? There's a total, uh, a total of five different kinds of stressors. Because once you can reframe it, then you can start thinking about, oh, well, what can I do? Maybe what you need is you're sitting in this one place all this time is really stressful for you. Maybe what you need to get up and, and jump and dance around. Another little one who has a physical stressor, it may be what they really need is that cozy, comforting uh, corner that we talked about before. So it really is examining, reframing, relabeling, see what other things can help soothe and bring that stress down to calm and alert. Does that make sense to you? There's a, a lot to take in all at once. That was excellent, Jean, thank you. I agree with you, Ross Green does have some good points about all behavior is a communication and they will behave if they can and if they can't, why not? What is the barrier that's creating this problem at the moment for the child? Yeah, I, you know, I think if we change our view of the child to one that we say the child is doing the best they can with what they have and that they're lagging in skills and we need to help them with skills. But you know what's also beautiful about this model of, of Ross Green and, Scott and Stuart Ablon is we can also apply it to the parent. Because you know what? The parents are doing the best that they can with what they have available to them. And they are, if we reach them out to them with compassion, then we can start asking them, well, what's important to you? What are your needs? What are your values? What are your goals and what are your strengths? What my friend Stephen de Groot uh, calls the core four. Because we may see a little one um, who is discombobulating um, uh, in, in, um, uh, when they're outside playing. And one mum may completely ignore it. And another mum gets jumped right on their case. Uh, this, uh, and, and so you can then say, well, what is it? What's the need of the mum? who jumps on the little one. And then you have a conversation and she says, well, what's important to me is that when I speak to my children, they listen to me and they're respectful to me. And so when he behaves like that, I think he's disrespecting me. And that means I'm not a very good mom and I don't want to look like that in the eyes of others. So when you start in relationship with people to ask them about their need, their core values, their need values, goals and strengths, then you can better come to an understanding, a compassionate view of how can the child's behavior be viewed as they are a kid who are doing the best that they can. I hope that that makes sense to you as well, I hope. It certainly does. And I think at the end of the day, what it all comes down to are meaningful connections with the children in our care, whether they're our own children or the children that we, we support in childcare settings, that it's to find the unique gifts that exist within each and every child and nurturing that and bringing that out uh, to everyone to see. Oh, I so love that. I love that, um, uh, Sue. You know, the, uh, the uh, First Nations, when I met uh, Tom Porter, a Mohawk elder, uh, the first time I heard him, he talked about children are the sacred ones. They each come with that special gift uh, for us to learn. And you know, what we find then is if you help kids understand their behavior, their parents as co-regulators and stress detectives who reflect and figure out, well, why do I need my kid to behave in this way as an example, then kids are more resilient. They're able to meet challenges, do well with challenges and uh, bounce back as it were. But they can't do that without the co-regulating of adults, without having a huge sense of safety, of uh, being significant in others' lives and also having a real purpose. So I know that uh, talking about uh, resilience is gonna be one of the things that uh, is coming up. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. 
Absolutely. So you've given a little teaser for our next session. It will be all about raising children with resiliency and building on all of the things that we've just spoken about and leading them down that pathway where they have the skills uh, in their back pocket and their toolbox that they can bring out in order to thrive during tough times and stressful times. It will all have those stressful times in our life and to be able to draw on our resiliency skills is a key factor for success right through to adulthood right well that's going to be a fun session for sure mm. i'm so glad that we're doing this and I'm, I'm so hopeful that it's helpful to people as they listen and we'll have our opportunity for question and answer in uh, in some of the next format that's right, thank you. As a wrap up for our session tonight, I'd like people to think about some of the things that we've talked about today and what resonated with you. If you can think of something that you've heard tonight that you can use in your practice later and reflect on how that worked for you. If there's something that you wanna to start to do or something that you wanna stop doing, give that some thought as well. We'll be posting on the ASCII website the template that you can fill in in order for you to have that for your continuous learning portfolio and something for you to bring to the conversation with Jean later when we can have a question and an answer period based on what we've talked about tonight.